Oh, Balo and Kerber, you're so fascinating. Wait, what's that sound? Must be somebody using central versus peripheral tables to try and make a diagnosis. Quick, to the YouTube. So I'm getting on YouTube to revisit one of the biggest myths about vertigo that I already busted a year and a bit ago. That's right, this is central versus peripheral tables to help you make the diagnosis in vertigo busted again. I'm Peter Johns, an emergency physician and vertigo education enthusiast practicing in Ottawa, Canada. There's many myths about vertigo that emergency physicians have held for decades, and I've made a few videos about the most prevalent ones. The problem is that these myths are very beguiling. You think you're getting useful information when in fact they only spread misinformation. Even smart, young ED docs are susceptible to these myths, and I recently found a video on YouTube published a month ago that unfortunately is a good example of that. Here is the video in question. It's been seen over a hundred times. I tried to contact the author of this video to voice my concerns, but now, weeks later, no reply. Rather than have this misinformation stand unchallenged, I decided to make this video to again show why we should stop teaching these kinds of tables. The basic problem with these tables is that they try and combine the clinical presentation of BPBV and vestibular neuritis on the peripheral side, when in fact these two common peripheral disorders present quite differently. And the clinical presentation of posterior circulation stroke can be so similar to, to vestibular neuritis that we need the HINTS exam to definitively sort it out. So lumping their clinical characteristics into these categories will only lead to confusion, as we'll soon see. So let's see what she says about peripheral versus central vertigo. These are different and they present differently, which is very handy. Things go off the rail early here. I just told you how vestibular neuritis and posterior circulation stroke can present in a very similar manner. So, not so handy. So if it's been kind of subtly increasing slowly over time, that is a big indicator that this might actually be something wrong with the brain, which is why it's really important and hard to notice central causes of vertigo. Posterior circulation stroke, which is the most feared and dangerous central cause of vertigo, typically comes on suddenly as she states when she talks about Wallenberg syndrome a mere two and a half minutes earlier in her video. It's going to be very acute onset. Maybe she got this from another YouTube video published two years ago, which contained the same misinformation. Central, in contrast, is usually slow on onset. It's central and it's something slowly growing, like a tumor, that's interfering with your balance. And so it doesn't come on suddenly. Now, vestibular schwannoma do come on slowly, but they are a very rare cause of vertigo and actually begin in the peripheral nerve and then spread centrally. I haven't seen a case in 36 years of medical practice, so very misleading and dangerous to say central vertigo comes on slowly. Peripheral causes, on the other hand, are big, they're dramatic, they're intense. These people can't walk down the hallway. This happens suddenly. This is exactly how a posterior circulation stroke can present. Sure, vestibular neuritis can present this way as well, but they should be able to walk unaided. They'll be wobbly, but they should be able to walk down the hall. Any patient who can't walk down the hall needs a stroke workup. Her table also says that peripheral causes are intermittent. And the dizziness comes and goes. But that central causes are constant. BPBV, the most common and curable cause of peripheral vertigo, generally presents with 20 to 30 seconds of intense dizziness brought on by head movements. And vestibular neuritis, another peripheral cause, is the most common cause of constant vertigo where you see nystagmus at rest. And they have constant vertigo for many hours or days that is only worsened with head movements. Let's move on to what she says about fatigability. Now the last bit on here that I want to mention is the fatigability. And I'm specifically um, mentioning fatigability when we're talking about nystagmus. Eventually it'll either slow and stop and that means it's fatigable. That is more indicative of a peripheral problem than a central problem. If, however, the nystagmus continues, I'm going to say for at least over 30 seconds, then that is probably not fatigable, and it definitely indicates that it's a bigger problem, it's a brain problem, and we need to pay more attention to it. First of all, she's confusing fatigability with duration. Duration is how long the patient is feeling dizzy and having nystagmus for, if it's present. Fatigability, on the other hand, is the phenomena in posterior canal BPVV, where the Dix-Hallpike test is positive, 
meaning the patient has vertigo, and demonstrates the typical rotatory towards the downward ear and vertical nystagmus as seen here. Then, if you were to repeat the dix hall pike test, the patient would have lesser or no dizziness or nystagmus. But as clearly stated in the excellent and comprehensive clinical practice guideline by Bhattacharya, repeat testing with the dix hall pike test to demonstrate fatigability is no longer part of the diagnosis for BPPV, as it's basically torturing the patient and may make curing the patient with the Epley maneuver less successful. So in summary, this video and its use of its peripheral versus central vertigo table has led to these misleading and dangerous statements. That central causes of vertigo only come on slowly. This is how you miss a stroke presenting with vertigo. This kind of misinformation will kill people. That all peripheral and central disorders present dissimilarly. Guess why the HINTS exam was developed? To use subtle but easily tested eye findings to definitively rule out stroke in patients with constant vertigo and nystagmus. Most of these patients will have vestibular neuritis, but some will be posterior circulation stroke masquerading as vestibular neuritis. That patients with vestibular neuritis can't walk down the hall. Anyone who can't walk down the hall unaided should be worked up for stroke, as I wrote in my Big Three of Vertigo Protocol, which you can find in the ninth edition of Fentanelli's Emergency Medicine, or in my CMAJ article, which I'll link to in this video's description. Or just watch my Big Three of Vertigo video, which you can find by clicking on this link. And suggesting that nystagmus in all peripheral disorders is intermittent and not constant completely ignores the fact that vestibular neuritis presents this way and is the commonest cause of constant vertigo and nystagmus at rest that is seen in the emergency department. And lastly, fatigability does not equal duration, which I just discussed. I hope you can now see that rather than guide the vertigo learner to the correct diagnosis, this little table of peripheral versus central vertigo will in fact confuse them, which is how they go from being vertigo novices to being vertigo confused and then to the vertigo disengaged where they can stay there throughout their career when they enter the vertigo vicious cycle of vexation. Instead, watch my videos, especially the big three of vertigo. And if you apply yourself and try and understand this sometimes difficult topic, you too can become vertigo confident. Thanks for watching.